to say something. Hi, gang. All right. All right. We're starting. Silence. Okay. Hi, All right. Howdy, howdy there, RJ. How are you? Hot here in Spokane. Everybody hearing me okay? Well, at the, uh, I'm hearing you fine. And uh, let's see. Interesting. We got, we got it. Uh, it's uh, the uh, the creator page hasn't updated yet. We've obviously got a fleet of folks watching because they're talking, and yet uh, it still shows up. With, it still shows up from Google. Still shows up as zero watching at the moment. I'm pretty sure Fino and David are watching. <laughs> anyway, all right. Well, well. Good evening, all. And uh, here, let me. Uh, you know what? Maybe I'll throw out a, a, a link to. Oh, I already. Okay, we got one running on Twitter. Great. All right. Well, welcome back. Uh, let us get started. Um, RJ, we were talking a little yeah, earlier. Let's see I... which windows I want to have poking around here. I'm inclined to think that I can use this one here. Uh, pardon all of you out in video land. Uh, we were just experimenting with the live chat and the potential after party show and all that kind of stuff. Uh, so we were doing experiments and, and uh, usually frazzled trying to get used to all this newfangled technology. Indeed. The. Um... For you guys, the, the, the after show, which seems to have become very popular, um, we we decided, since this is the RJ show, this is this is not the Psy Strike show, everybody knows that. Um, the only reason we're doing it on my channel is because we're, we're, we're getting RJ's channel ready for this kind of thing. Um, so, as a first step, the after show, which is, like I said, is just seems to be growing in popularity, will be on RJ's channel, and we'll put the link up for that obviously of course um and Got eventually all jolly well set up indeed and eventually the whole show that this the evolution hour will be completely on rj's channel and he'll be uh, flying you know flying solo so um but we're doing we're doing it in, we're doing it in baby steps uh today just the uh just the just the after show is going to be on rj's channel so all right uh, RJ, we were talking a little earlier. Uh, there was a uh, a topic that you thought we did not uh, we did not cover in sufficient detail uh, previously. Um, oh, I think that that the the speciation concept, because it's so at a core of how anti evolutionists have their head up their ass, that it's kind of <laughs> useful to get a clear idea or clearer idea of how that applies in the real world and how it applies in the fossil context. So uh, if I want to wing it, there we go. Um, the first thing to remember about speciation is, boy, is it microevolutionary. Um, as uh, Stephen Jay Gould once said, you could stare at speciating bees for your entire life and you're not going to see much happen. And whenever what, what a speciation of animals is a population of organisms, and it's more complicated if you deal with bacteria because they can change genetic information differently than sexually reproducing ones. But for sexually reproducing ones like vertebrates, like us, um, a, a population is going to remain very stable. However, there's going to be variation in it. It's that tiny amount of difference that eventually it reaches a point where either machine and took the current population and tried to interbreed it with the past population, they wouldn't because they have now become a new species. Or, as is the case more often in what's called allopatric uh, speciation by geographic distribution, where an A has varied so much across its range that functionally there's a new B, an almost identical species that actually won't interbreed with the 
areas around at the other end. And if you have them separated, bingo, you've got separate species. Uh, this is very clear in what are called ring species, and everybody can Google that. Uh, um, salamanders are an example, and the, and the herring gull around the Arctic Ocean is um, uh, a really critical factor. If you, if you imagine, if you just imagine yourself looking down on the, the flat earth map that pops up when we do deal with Jaronism, and you follow from um, Alaska all the way around the ring of the Arctic Ocean until you get to uh, Siberia. Uh, put that in your head. Now you can imagine that there's an A and then next to it in, in uh, Alaska and then a B next to it and a C next to the B and a D next to the N all the way around in a chain of almost virtually identical uh, herring gulls until you get all the way around to Siberia with say a G. Now A will breed with B and B with C and C with D and D with E and E with F and F with G. All the same species, right? except you'll discover A and G won't interbreed because the variation in that ring is so large that the A's and the G's technically have become separate species. That kind of window is what happens all the time in speciation processes. There's also a fancy term, prezygotic isolation mechanisms, that if you think about, if you have a population of organisms, you can have the, the, the one interbreeding with the male of another subpopulation and their deems and avatars there's a whole bunch of technical terms that have popped up uh, to refer to these kind of subsections or the male interbreeding with the female so you have a bunch of four crossways that you can deal with uh they found this particularly in fruit flies you get to a stage where you can breed in one direction from the female to the male but not from the male to the female population subset and eventually it'll reach the point where neither one of them will do. And at that point, bingo, you have full uh, zygotic isolation and an actual speciation of that. Now, in every one of these cases, you're talking about critters that are still the same. And the creationists will jump in on that and say, well, there are still flies. There's still birds. They're still fill in the blanks. And that's where their brain seizes up. Even the ones who recognize this, Michael Denton, uh, the intelligent design guy, recognizes ring species and speciation among Galapagos finches on isolated islands and all that. But he still falls into that, oh, it's just the same bit. All anti-evolutionists, and in fact, I think a lot of common sense evolutionists have a snag concept of that microevolutionary speciation event and imagine what can happen to a population of organisms not only over one breeding cycle, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, thousands, 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 tens of thousands of years, a hundred thousand years, a million years, and what kind of tiny variations add up. The best concept that I've ever seen of it. Oh, Fino has a question. Jump right in there. He is, uh, uh, Fino has asked. Is there a number of how many ring species biologists know of? This, I don't know. <laughs> Ooh, um, wow. Well, I know of two main ones. There's salamanders down in California, ring species of herring gulls. I think there may be more because I haven't done a comprehensive survey of it. They're hard to identify because you got to traipse all over the place, a gradient, and interbreed things. <laughs> This is not something you do on a, on a casual afternoon, so it's not an easy thing to identify. The suspicion will be, and you find this in the current taxonomy of giraffes um, about uh, interbreeding as to how many species of giraffe there are, which is really bringing up an interesting idea, is how do you identify a speciation event in practice? It's going to involve this gradual isolation thing, which they've done. I suppose you could argue that all of the work that they've done with the various fruit fly species is an example in effect of laboratory recreation of deems and avatars and ring species because they can look at subsections of populations and literally interbreed them because fruit flies do it. They're randy little bastards and you can do it quite quickly. So they're an easy organism to deal with. But yeah, I know of two main ring species that have been identified in the wild. There may very well be more. Um, uh, any other questions? Oh, uh, uh, greenish warmer in the Himalayas. It could very well be. Yeah, you, you people out there will very well have encountered other examples. Uh, a, uh, ooh, puteronogen. Boy, that's an easy one to mispronounce. Wow. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, very well. I'm, I suppose I should write down the little notes on that and do some background research.
uh, on uh, ring species just to be on Sayus things in the things in the Himalayas uh, Himalayan greenish warblers yeah I'll have to look at that later because actually the more examples the better uh, uh, one of the things if I can ever keep at it long enough to be able to do it um, will be uh, a whole thing on the speciation issue and how it applies to both the understanding of it from a biological end and how anti-evolutionists deal with it. And I already know a lot of how anti-evolutionists don't deal with this problem. So here you got your organisms and variation among them. How do you spot um, a speciation event in the happening? If you look, I've got a lot of stuff about incipient speciation, which is where they're looking. I've probably got dozens of them in the bibliography of examples among birds and various other animals of where they're seeing the amount of variation and the amount of, of incipient zygotic isolation, depending upon how the things are interbreeding and how their hybridization zones are working. You find them in squirrels. Uh, there's been a lot of analysis on that stuff and that as well. And you've got lots of factors that can come into play. Mitochondrial DNA has a tug for maintaining a species that's separate from the nuclear DNA. So you can actually see in the hybridization zones in squirrels, uh, his name started with an S, uh, I can't remember, it was Sutherland or Southron or something like that. Um, I attended a lecture, he did at our Darwin Day here at Eastern uh, a couple of years back, excellent analyses. And he's a major player on this field. Uh, he investigates, uh, I think the brown squirrels or something of the Pacific Northwest. So it's it's a, a local area. But they are able to delineate exactly why these hybridization zones as a new species is forming or occurring because of the, the, the tug of war between the nuclear DNA and then the mitochondrial DNA, which is separate. And it performs these little complex little dance. Well, anyway, all of that stuff in principle is going on always in speciation processes. But what do you do to see how things are happening in a fossil context? Well, what you're gonna be spotting is taxonomical. You're gonna be seeing an animal, you find this in the tri uh, Triceratops bunch where there was a big debate and still is about how many species of Triceratops are there. Is it one big species that you're seeing the variety of, of geographic deems? Or is it a, a series of things that have actually branched off to form separation speciation events? We can't interbreed Triceratops. All you've got is the damn skull. But over and over again, you find there's taxonomical uncertainty in zones where it's likely that a speciation event is in the process of happening or has just recently happened. That's why it's hard to delineate how much natural variation there is as, as to whether it's a separate species or not. Now, once it settles down, it's much easier to identify genuses and then higher up families and so forth because they've had a chance to delineate. Um, the best example I've seen visually to conceptualize what's going on here is that wonderful thing where there's a long paragraph letters blue and ends up red at the end. And when you look letter by letter by letter by letter, it just gets progressively less blue and progressively more red. There's no point in which it flips from blue to red. There is no letter that's half blue, half red. It's always a single color, but the gradations are so gentle that no abruptness to it. If you only look tunnel vision at each little adjacent word, they all look virtually the same color. It's only when you step back and look at the whole chain that you realize the words started out blue and now at the end of the paragraph, they're all red. That's what's going on by analogy in the microevolution leads to macroevolution kind of phenomenon. Another important lesson to remember is how rare macroevolutionary events are. The vast majority of the fossil record are just these little teeny microevolution shifts where things are staying pretty much in the same realm and they go along in that mode until they finally go extinct quite a long ways later. But with a history of vertebrate life that's half a billion years long, um, you're going to have some amazing examples. And you've got what I would call low level macroevolution, like the horse sequence, where you take essentially the same anatomy of an animal that's about the size of a collie. Uh, Herakotherium and that bunch. And then over the course of millions of years, you see it proliferating and eventually some of them are the ones that you end up calling horses. Overall anatomy remains pretty much the same. It's just a bigger across the side toes and we can actually see the genus. Here's another one of those speciation events. There's the, the Dinohippus genus 
actually has species in it or are they the same species but actually have variation within that species we don't know we can't even breed them but still ones where the one genus has the full side toes and the other gene uh, species within the genus has lost them they are catching that genetic switch that's deactivating those little side toes and by the way all horses start out with the full complement of five toes and gradually during the embryology development get rid of them so you can see that from the genetic end the other variation mainly with uh, horses are the way the teeth have been shaped and now that we're into paleogenomics there hadn't been a lot of work on this on uh, a, a horse teeth shape before because they didn't have the genes available but now that they've started retroengineering mammal teeth literally um it's only a matter of time before they work out all the ins and outs not only of horse teeth but i'm sure they'll be doing the same thing with mammoths and any of these other specialized herbivores that have particular crown structures and that that, that enable them to uh, deal with specialized diets remember your horses have to deal with a lot of grass that's uh, hard to muck up and chew and so it requires specialized grinding features to the teeth and uh, that stuff will work out um so any of these areas where you're looking at in the past you're more likely to spot the details if you've got a huge fossil record which you do for foraminifera the little itty bitty microorganisms plankton things where they just rain their little shell bodies down on the on the sea uh, in enormous quantities and you've got millions of years of records of some of these things you can literally see the speciation events going on you can find one and microevolutionary variation within the speciation event. You can find this all over the place. And then they can start looking at the living organism to see the kind of genetic systems that are involved in that. When you're dealing with the ones that have a sparser fossil record, and that was the whole point behind punctuated equilibrium, that if you understand most speciation events in vertebrates are occurring because of geographic distribution, unless you've got the fossils to cover the entire range of the damn organism, how could you spot a herring gull? speciation event fossils from everywhere from alaska all the way around the arctic ocean to um uh, siberia that's not all that common in the real world oh rj i just copied an email from fino into the twitter chat oh yes. we got to go that's um, a lot of windows huh <laughs> oh and i will i will advise you another address the first you can say the first part but address the first part in the after show please <laughs> Oh, somebody's being funny, huh? <laughs> That's how that goes. Maybe I may not even be catching the Twitter feed, so. Uh, ha, 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 ha. That's a long one. Yeah. Okay. I'll have to leave that up there and deal with that after the fact. So I will. I will only deal with that in the after show. I, I plead totally guilty All on right, that. But the, the second the second half is is uh, fully appropriate for now. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I only glanced over the length of it, and, and uh, I'm sure it's going to be deliciously snarky, and I will be taken down several notches. But hopefully that gives a little clearer sense of how you try to connect up speciation events with a creationist trying to wheel their way around macroevolution. Because the creationist is always going to be snagging on the fact that the microevolutionary speciation events are always going to be just pretty much the same. What they can't get is that big picture map of time stuff. And they usually don't ever bother noticing about it. They're not paleontologists. They don't work out a map of time in their head. They have no clue the sheer bulk and range of all the critters knocking around. I tried to give a flavor of that pictures in. I would like to in a, uh, an edition that had that uh, in the slam dunk. And uh, the, the chapter that I had on um, uh, um, Hunt's 1997 talk origins piece that Krager, the creationist, goes after, uh, basically is a walk through the entire reptile mammal transition over that whole hundred million year period. And there's a lot of taxa involved just to hit the high spots. And if you looked at those, you're seeing that a lot of the anatomy is very, very common. It's only just occurring ever so gently over that long period of time. And it's all microevolutionary. And all of that is speciation events. Pause for breath. You you breathed? I've never. Yeah, I do. I do that once in a while. Yeah, I actually breathe even while I talk. As I said, I breathe through my nose, so that's why I seem yes, to be able I, to run I, on and on. I'm, I don't recall seeing like I'm an automaton. For, I don't recall seeing a pause for breath in any recent shows. That was that was the time. Anyway, uh, yeah. <laughs> I was sorry. Forgive my shock. My shock at seeing that. <laughs> but, uh, 
Yeah, they, they, they <laughs> Tortucans, please. Yes, Fino, please, Tortucans. Yeah, and just, I, I, I'm trying to popularize that damn word because it's a non pejorative. Moron, frankly, is a term you don't even use in psychology anymore. It's it's highly pejorative and not terribly descriptive, other than just a technical description of somebody who has a particular IQ level with damned IQ tests that only measure the ability to take an IQ test. Uh, Tortucan says nothing. Black. They can be as sharp as a tack, a brilliant Tortucan, but they do have an ability not to think about things they don't think about. And that's the key. Their ability for their brain to self-medicate, for their brain to not conceptualize certain issues, for their brain to go, oh, no, you don't want to think about that. Just move on to another subject. Origins are bust, please. Uh, and you can see that happening all the time uh, on Twitter exchanges and in personal exchanges with people. Uh, and you can trigger it either on Twitter uh, or in live, if you identify somebody's Tortucan rut and ask them a question about it, and you'll get this deer in the headlight moment, answer a question you didn't ask. That's a dead giveaway that you're striking a Tortucan rut. And it'll occur in any context, politicians and others, it's not restricted to creationists. And it doesn't mean you're a moron. It only means your brain is just going, mean, 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 to uh, uh, keep you from thinking about the things you don't want to think about. All right. Um, yeah. With, with, uh, with, the, with the email I copied over to you, take, take, take a look starting at paragraph. Yes, paragraph one is the funny one. Paragraph two is, starting with paragraph two is the actual question that you, I believe you will find interesting. Oh, okay. So this is at the Twitter notification. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, okay. I'll look through that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> like this one, you okay? Down. Oh, go into a little bit more details about like from the earliest, most primitive bat fossils we know of, and how do they imply the wings involved? Oh, bats are a terrible case because we don't have the early bat fossils. The the and as creationists are really happy to point out uh, that uh, the moment you bring it up with them, all the bats are still flyers. So we don't have any fossil example of the group bats have developed from or something with just the very earliest stages of membrane flying and there's probably a damn good reason for that first of all bats fossilize very difficult uh, out of the 20 some odd families of bats most of them don't have a fossil record at all let alone one that we can trace back a ways um, it's still unclear when bats developed uh, the genetic data strongly suggests they predate the, the KT mass extinction. So they're developing at the same time as the late uh, dinosaurs and at a time when there were birds. That's If that's true, that screams nocturnal environment because the one area the birds didn't have staked down, we now have night flying owls, but that wasn't the case back when the, the, the birds of the Cretaceous were running amok or flapping amok. Uh, so the, the, there's a prima facie case to be made that bats are developing in a heavily nocturnal environment. We can surmise reasonably that just like pterosaurs, they develop from four-legged uh, critters, not bipeds like birds did, because the moment a bat lands on the ground, it's clamoring around on all fours, and it's never lost that dynamic. So we're talking about a quadrupedal, nocturnal, probably insectivore uh, that's got good hearing and probably good sound generation because it's eventually developing a lot of the architecture that's going to lead to um, uh, echolocation later on. Now, the one area where we have found fossil intermediates in this early stage, it's after they've already begun flying, but the very earliest bats don't echolocate well. They don't have, they can tell this from the cochlea and there's some bones in the ear that are unique to echolocators. And the full-blown echolocating bats date millions of years in the future, the first examples of those showing up. So we do in fact have transitional elements on those bats, but so far, we haven't had the luck of the draw. The fossil genie hasn't come through yet. Bats are very small. The earliest bats you can hold in your hand. They're very, very tiny animals. We have some huge fruit bats and crap now, but the earliest bats are very, very small. And when you have animals that are that tiny with those kinds of narrow bones going for lightweight because they're just starting to develop flying and uh, probably from a gliding environment, there's a lot of technical work imagining the kinds of natural stages that a bat would need to do in its evolutionary development. But, but yeah, we don't have the fossils yet on it. Uh, we don't have the fossils on the very earliest stages of bird evolution um, because the, uh, before Archaeopteryx, 
you've got relatively few deposits to look in for dinosaurs in general, let alone uh, for birds, and birds are very small animals. In fact, this bears as well on the feather preservation issue. Uh, feathers start showing up as um, uh, stray impressions uh, fairly frequently in the Cretaceous, and they show up in amber as well. Uh, before you have amber, though, you don't have things preserved in amber, and I think those really are Cretaceous phenomena. But um, we can surmise that if feathers are developing in dinosaurs generally, they can't be that popular. Otherwise, in the Jurassic, we would be seeing more stray feather impressions, and we aren't. So the, the logic is, is that the feathered theropod and eventually its bird offshoots are relatively narrow niche things. There's a, still a debate now. Um, the latest paper on the tyrannosaur, the skin that they found, suggests that no, the full-blown tyrannosaurs were not covered with fur, uh, with fe feathers. Uh, there may be the smaller ones, solurosaurs and the smaller micro tyrannosaurs and all of that. Remember, a tyrannosaur is a gigantic solurosaur. It's a jumbo solurosaur. And so it's entirely likely that even if there was a certain amount of sexual display feather systems that partly was connected to insulation of the chick when it's born, but they basically outgrow them when they become adults. And with a really big animal with a huge amount of, of internal temperature environment it, and in a relatively warm world, it certainly doesn't need feathers uh, to keep itself warm. Theoretically, find examples of feathered dinosaurs in um, ones that live in the Arctic. Um, uh, in the theropod line, and the paleontology, I'm sure, is going to continue on about this. But my guesstimation at the moment, based on the science, is that um, the evolution of birds are taking place in a relatively niche level over about a 10 million year period preceding Archaeopteryx. So that's about 160 million down to about 150 million years ago. And we don't have a hell of a lot of data on that. How much of it's, oh, a Scottish gamer has come in with a question. What is that one? Uh, what other modern animals do we have very little fossil evidence? Do we have very little? Oh, wow. Very good question. I got to rack my brain on that one. That's almost an RJ stumper. I got to uh, do my uh, things because I'm so used to thinking in terms of the, the, the purely extinct forms. Um, terribly, oh, chimpanzees have a terrible fossil record. Uh, they live in exactly the environment that is terrible for fossil preservation. It's humid. It's corrosive, bones get bleep, obliterated very, very easily. Uh, so, you know, if you want to have a, a primate that lives in the desert, that's one thing. It has a much better chance of being fossilized and, and uh, uh, ideally, uh, well, not a desert so much, but a dry environment that has a lot of alluvial deposits that washes its stuff downstream. <laughs> that's not chimpanzee land. Relatively bad fossil record. Uh, and of course, I mentioned the bats. I'm trying to think hominids. Uh, we bipedal primate bunch have a much better fossil record than the poor chimpanzees do. Um, I'm thinking elsewhere, some of the, um, uh, of living animals. Boy, that's a really fun little thing on that because most of the ones, um, the whales, of course, now we have a way better fossil record than we did before. So there's an awful lot of linkages and we found transitional forms uh, on uh, both the echolocating aspect of whales and also the development of the toothless baleen variety. There was just a recent intermediate. The fossil genie really loves Darwin and evolutionists. The, 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 the fossil genie just doesn't seem to like creationists much. Not only A, because they don't predict anything, but B, they don't, you know, well, one crocoduck would really be a problem for evolution. I don't know if poor Kirk Cameron knows this, but that would be a big difficulty for evolution, but not for uh, creationism. So it, uh, the designer is really missing out on that. Uh, yeah, I think I've actually covered, um, uh, trying to think now, insects that are the problem with a lot of insect groups. First of all, they're really tiny. Uh, and also, a lot of them have really slow diversification patterns. So uh, if you're looking for the earliest stages of ants, we're talking back in the Cretaceous. And so there's a terrible fossil record for the early branching ants because they, they only find out about them later on after they've already developed because they're now getting trapped in amber. A huge proportion of ant fossils come from amber. Uh, so some little ants trip along and then suddenly it's stuck beautiful preservation. So they're good in one way because you have fantastic interior detail. But the other part is that before amber, you don't get a fossil record. So I'd say insects among living groups 
very, very difficult to get a, uh, a grip on there. Hope that answered the question a little bit on that. Oh, AJS, uh, you made that for at least 10,000 years. <laughs> oh, yeah, the fossilization issue about, um, as paleontologists always like to point out, fossilization is not like a door slamming shut in levels of circumstance and depends a great deal on ocean chemistry. One of the hot topics in a lot of these Lagerstätten deposits, and I mentioned that fancy little word with the umlaut before, uh, I strongly suggest the people will go and uh, and Google that thing, um, that they are usually based upon very unusual uh, anoxic environments, so lakes that have very bad circulation so that there's very little oxygen down below and organisms that can eat up stuff tend not to live down there. And so um, that's why things can fall down. The, the Solnhofen Lagoon that you get so much for uh, that, that relates to Archaeopteryx and a bunch of other things, that's one of those anoxic lagoons uh, from the Jurassic 150 million years ago. Messel. Uh, in Germany is another anoxic lagoon, rather toxic, and that's where some of the earliest bats are known. And uh, in fact, the one weird little critter, uh, it's a bipedal dinosaur shaped um, uh, teeter totter format mammal. It's kind of like a rabbit uh, with a kind of a long neck and quite a long stabilizing tail. That's really unusual. Bipedalism is not something we mammals do all that often. And apparently it wasn't terribly useful because it didn't lead to anything. It, it's just a little lineage that died out, but it, it was a natural experiment. Uh, the, the, the big ones for my interest in uh, Lagerstätten dynamics are the three Lagerstätten in the Cambrian. Um, uh, uh, Burgess Shale and Sirius Passet, which is in Greenland, and then uh, Ch Shang Zhang uh, in China. Um, those are spread over quite a few millions of years, all equatorial. In nature even though every one of them is in the northern hemisphere now because the continents have moved around and um the fact that you've got not one not two but three detailed pro fossil preservation deposits from the cambrian is saying something really important about the weird ocean chemistry that was going on there it wasn't occurring everywhere you needed a landslide to come down to bury stuff but whatever it was had combination of preservation issues that uh, occurred three times over um, different zones along that uh, uh, tropical zone and that certainly ocean temperature must have had something to do with it because we don't have any Cumbrian lo lager state in, in northern latitudes. Uh, you do find uh, uh, northern latitude stuff, uh, trilobite fossils and stuff like that, but trilobites have a hard carapace and they molt constantly and that's why we have so many trilobite fossils. But that stuff and two, the Eddie Akar, although um, uh, I think Duchenne, so the one that has the little fossil embryos, that's another one that's a chemistry issue. That, that phosphatization is that will only preserve stuff up to about half a millimeter. And so you get the embryos, and it just drives paleontologists nuts because if it were just a little bigger, just a few more cell divisions, you could tell if it was an arthropod or not. That, that, that the cell divisions would be such that the characteristic embryology developmental patterns of particular phyla would be identifiable but that damned half a millimeter cutoff point they're not big enough to be able to tell what the hell they turn into that's some of the inevitable bits and of course the creationists when and intelligent designers when they prattle on about the cambria and they never go into any of that forensic detail <laughs> Oh, a lot of living fossils are marines, aren't they? Uh, not entirely. Uh, Tutara, the little um, um, a bit, uh, is classified as a living fossil. Uh, but they generally tend to be marine ones. For one thing, uh, coelacanths are the archetypal example. The one feature that seems fairly common among um, animal living fossils, and there are plant living fossils too, um, is that they're generalists. Coelacanths will eat just about anything, and they have a very low, leisurely lifestyle. They live fairly deep down. They have a fairly steady diet of whatever it is that comes along. They're out of the range of a lot of active predators. Uh, they're in a nice little zone because a lot of the active predators function much higher up on the food chain. You know, it, it takes a be an active predator in the dark. Um, and we still have a, a big issue about how sperm whales go after um, uh, your uh, good old um, hyper frisky um, uh, super duper um, squid uh, that there's the current suspicion is that um, the sperm whale sends out an acoustic shock wave 
uh, with its echo locating system that it goes basically boom and while the squid is in yagada yagada whoa mode uh, it becomes dinner <laughs> uh, but nobody's ever been able to actually test that out because it's really difficult to follow sperm whales down to their feeding depth it's really dark and deep but coelacanths live fairly low uh, it's one of the reasons why they escaped detection for so long they didn't get fossilized a great deal and they didn't get caught as fishermen for a long time and then somebody brought them up in the indian ocean and they go oh the living fossil has survived the evolution is falsified because we've discovered the coelacanth lived on but they're not identical to the cretaceous ones 60 million years is uh not um uh, show no change at all and uh now that they've started looking into the various coelacanth species they can see that their immune system is showing the first transitional stages of the kind of immune systems that are developing later on in the terrestrial vertebrates that are coming from their fairly close cousins in the Ripidistian fish. So there's yet more evolutionary data uh, lurking around in the old coelacanth beside the fact that it's a air quotes living fossil. <laughs> oh. Yeah, anybody else? Uh, oh, yes, I'll try to avoid any Bill Cosby references. That's It's it's too pleasant a, a, a warm day to go into that uh, a side issue. Anybody got some more questions that popped up? And uh, we still got some time to go. Last on screen that I missed. I'm... Oh, the duck bills. Oh, oh, 90, yeah. Uh, are we talking about platypuses, Baron? Uh, if so, um, I had a section on um, the platypuses that I had to do research on for Slam Dunk because, uh, first of all, uh, they pop up peripherally in the creationism thing where they will say, evolutionists think this is a transition between birds and mammals. Uh, no, I'm afraid not. But the interesting thing, too, once in a while, I'll see some evolutionist uh, that will pop up and will say, see, there's, there's this transitional feature and you've got this half... Uh, a mammal half a bird laying eggs, and then you got the duck bill. Uh, no, the duck bill is, is not homologous to any bird bill. Uh, the, the dynamics of what they're made from, they're soft tissue, they're not formed from the little bone that occurs in the front end of the uh, dinosaur. And in fact, there's technical papers that have actually helped retro engineer um, the front end of a, of a bird's beak. Very different dynamics. But they're fascinating things because they're echo look uh, or acoustic, um, uh, electro sensing systems. Uh, in the platypus. And in fact, what I discovered that was so intriguing is why platypuses are toothless. They have very, they've got a, like a tiny teeth that's used to break out of their egg and they've got a, um, a, a couple other side teeth that have still survived. But basically the, the, um, uh, the um, platypuses have become toothless and it turns out there's a, it's a side reason. And that's because they've become increasingly dependent on electrosensing in the really murky waters they live in over millions of years in fact there's a transitional platypus in that that have been discovered on these issues but anyway it turns out when you look developmentally at the neural wiring and the sensory systems of how these vertebrate electrosensing systems have expanded in the platypus they're crowding out the tooth roots that would normally form in a platypus and in order to develop that the selection pressure is for less teeth teeth at all because they can't share the same space up in there so there is a fascinating developmental biology reason why the platypus has developed into a toothless form because it's it's working much better with that electrosensing ain't you wonderful <laughs> all right time for a commercial all right time for a commercial <laughs> there we go everybody there we go. there's a patreon link down the bottom I'd recommend going there. Okay, thus ended the commercial. Back to RJ. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Aaron, that was as inoffensive <laughs> yeah, as possible. Uh, what I also fascinating about um, the research that I've been doing and reading in primary sources and why I'm such an addict on it now is I learned so damn much that I never even knew I didn't know until I took the pains of reading the primary source material. Uh, I knew diddly squat about ant metapleural glands uh, before I uh, stumbled upon the stupid reference in uh, Michael Denton's book where he was trotting out all of these complicated features that are characteristic of the ant kind or type. And he uses typology. And uh, he never explained anything about it in his book. He just tosses this off like gee whiz. Well, I started researching them. 
And it's really fascinating to discover this metapleural gland, which is a diagnostic feature of ants. In fact, if you remove the metapleural gland from the ant, it's called a wasp. <laughs> so it's the, the, the characteristic diagnostic feature uh, on that. And yes, there's 20,000 species of ants and very few of the metapleural glands have ever been able to be studied. They're very tiny. And I was amazed to discover that nobody knows what they do. <laughs> None of the people who have actually started investigating the metaporal glands over the last 20 years have been able to figure out yet what they do and whether all of them do the same thing or not. So it's literally an open field in antdom uh, that I'm sure we'll be developing later on. But if you think of how small an ant is, and then how tiny this little metaporal gland is on the back end of the ant, and then you have to figure out what genes are involved in making it and what gene products are done in making it, it's not an easy thing to do. <laughs> mm. It's an amazingly complicated thing to do. You really got to love your ants to be able to do that work. Oh, here's a question you, you put for you, sir. You put a tiny tweezer it's... and do the little DNA test. So it's still ongoing work, and I'll be fascinated to see. And I can guarantee you no anti-evolutionist is going to be doing that work. <laughs> hey, RJ, um, Heavy Hauler would like to know yeah. what you knew about the uh, platypus ancestors. What were they like in the way back? That's, uh... Oh, oh, yeah! All of them develop uh, monotreme. There's, there's the, the marsupials and monotremes and, and placentals are the three groups of mammals, and uh, most marsupials are found only in Australia. The monotremes are found in Australia, and that's because developed, uh, the monotremes and a lot of the marsupials really had a difficult time competing with the new placental mammals that developed. But if you look at back in the fossil record, monotremes are known outside of Australia in very primitive form, and likewise for marsupials that had a much greater range. And there are still marsupial possums and all these other things that, that um, exist uh, in the Northern Hemisphere. But once Australia move far enough away from its competitors so that it now became essentially an island continent there and on New Zealand and Tasmania just went amok and they dominated the show. So they developed large killer kangaroos and uh, uh, that there were, there were no endemic dentals known in Australia until human beings bring them in when they arrived there about 40, 50, 60,000 years ago. And so they, we have the, 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 the dingo and all that stuff. Those were brought with human beings. And that's had a, a dynamic change on the environment. But essentially, this is a gigantic evolutionary experiment. You, you don't have any. I have a whole section on it in Dinomania uh, at uh, hashtag tip on uh, um, uh, Dwayne Gish and his claptrap on the ten of of, uh, 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 of uh, New Zealand or Australia, where... Um, uh, there are no sloths or uh, hedgehogs or any other animals. There are just marsupials that resemble them. And it's all convergent evolution. And you can trace the details of it. And I went into a lot of the little stuff on that. And this is also a problem, not only for the intelligent designers who don't think about it at all, but uh, the flood geology gang. Because since all of the immediately antecedent fossils for all of these uh, Australian uh, forms are only known in Australia, it's endemic evolution. How the hell did they get on the ark and how did they get back as a unit? Just supposedly having how many marsupial kinds are there? We don't know. They never think about it. Um, they, they, they scamper off. What if uh, did they always live in Australia and they get on a little junket where God has them all arrive up with Noah? And, and they're and are they clean or unclean animals? So I guess they're maybe clean animals. So there would be seven of each. And they would then uh, climb on board the ark and then at the ark settles. Boop, on Ararat, and they all get off, and every single one of these go on a beeline junket back to Australia because that's the only place we found them. And we don't find the slightest trace anywhere in between for these things. Apparently, no human being ever encountered any of them or made any mention of these strange little things. Like kangaroos are kind of distinctive. You know, you think you might notice them hopping past, but no, nobody ever does that. So um, the, the, the Australian phenomenon uh, of the marsupials and their origins. Uh, and how they become eventually so many of them become restricted to that island continent and why they go off on their own unusual way. Why don't we find such diversity anywhere else? Because they're competing with placentals everywhere else. <laughs> so I hope that answered that a little bit. 
on that. That's a fascinating subject. <laughs> Have to be unclean because they weren't domesticated. That could very well be it. Yeah, I, I can't remember all of them. That's uh, B.J. Price's comment in there. Um, that um, there's a certain amount. I know reptiles are supposedly unclean, and therefore there's an argument among the young earth creationists. Like this is like how many angels dance on a head of a pin. Uh, the dinosaurs must therefore be unclean, so they only have to have two examples of them. But they still can't quite figure out how many. And then the the, the really pathetic thing is. If you go to like the Ark Encounter and look at the critters there are there, none of that developed by creationists. They don't have any taxonomy. They don't have any fossil reconstructions done by any of them because they don't do any of that. So they have stolen all of the legitimate science work of the real paleontologists who have been working over, in some cases, over a century to work out what things look like, how they're put together, what their muscles and all that things are. And then they just steal that to make their little audio animatronic figures to make it look like, oh, and see how wonderful it is. We're all sciencey. We're up to date. Yeah, because you're copying people, except only the parts you want to copy. <laughs> <coughs> if they're skinny, four, if they're fat. Now, at, uh, alas, it's purely to do with clean and unclean dynamics. And uh, we have to remember, too, that the Bible world had a very small list of critters on it. That, that um, They were all familiar farm animals. They were cows and there were birds. And they didn't go into a hell of a lot of detail on that. You got some mythical animals, uh, Leviathan, which is probably a garbled account of a whale, um, and which they didn't bump into a hell of a lot because the uh, Israelites didn't really live in the sea environment all that much, except they just went out for local fishing. Um, uh, behemoth, no, it's not a brontosaurus. I'm terribly sorry. I'm really sure that it was a hippopotamus and not a bad description of one. But um, the kind of animals they're talking about are all familiar barnyardy kinds of animals and the ones that were domesticated within their environment. Do they talk about maize and corn? Of course not, because the people that wrote the Bible didn't know about the entire new world. Did they go on and on about rice? and 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 silk and all of these other things no because they lived in a really narrow part of mesopotamia and 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 the middle east they didn't and that's where they got their worldview and their mythology and all of their things from they didn't know diddly squat about everybody living across the mountain ranges and uh they weren't exactly keeping close tabs on these things tiny narrow world and then when you finally got out into the age of exploration uh, I, I alluded to this in, I think, tip 1.4. I made a listing about how the just exploded because of this. It went from like a few hundred to suddenly thousands and then tens of thousands and then hundreds of thousands. And every damned island they found, they found endemic species. And of course, that's why Darwin was dragooned to go on this uh, expedition. He was kind of an afterthought. And the guy who was the actual naturalist on board and have kept on getting seasick and i think they had to put him off somewhere and so darwin picked up the slack and he was having fun and they kept on finding stuff when they got to the galapagos islands at the end of things he was still just kind of learning his trade and he saw all these odd birds and so he but he literally went no oh, damn it i didn't write down what islands they were on i didn't do that i was stupid uh, and in some respects, some of the ethnologists even today have to go back and try to figure out which of the islands these were from because there's been so much variation in the time since then. Oh, check Paul's question. We got one well, far up there. Any thoughts on Grand Canyon giving Snelling his permit in order to drop the lawsuit? That's a good one. They might, especially in the Trump administration, they might put pressure on the uh, Geological Survey uh, Department to uh, let him do it. Um, the science area, I'm sure the regular geologists in there are going to say bullpucky. Uh, this guy has no legitimate science interest doing this, but we are now in Trumplandia. Yeah. So done. I would not be at all surprised if that happens, and it will become a cause celeb if it does. It happened. <coughs> it, it has happened, I, I believe. He and has, decided to let him do it? I, I believe that is I the case, it. embarrassingly enough. Oh, I'll have to take a check on that. Yeah, I hadn't known that it had gotten settled on that, and so you'll want to see who made the decision and who or whether there was any overriding i'm sure the national center for science education a bit on this and Bar braderman and a few other people so i'll, I'll have to get a uh, a look-see on that now will the world go to an end uh because snelling picks up some damn rocks 
Uh, no, because uh, he can manage just to do the shtick on himself. I'll be intrigued to see his sciency paper that he does on that, and I'm sure we can guess what the conclusion is going to be. <laughs> it's going to prove that the Grand Canyon is formed in the flood, and so it'll be just a fun matter of figuring out what information he's leaving out in order to arrive at that preordained conclusion, because boy, I know how good Snelling is at leaving information out. Um, a creationist uh, linked, uh, some of you who follow me on Twitter may have spotted this, um, a preacher, I think his name is um, the moniker he goes by, and he um, uh, linked to this Snelling video that he urged me to look at. Here's the evidence for all of that catastrophic flood. So I went through, watched the whole damn thing, and I was looking at the primary sources, or rather what you had to do research to find, because he never offered any sources. He just showed pictures of stuff. And I, he would mention the name of a place or, or a particular taxa name once in a while, but no references. And I found out actually that Snelling had already talked about all this claptrap before. They were in a variety of postings he had done over 20 years, in fact, and some of them weren't in my bibliography, so I added them in there. But I was also checking up on the source data. Uh, one, uh, um, uh, one of them that I thought was particularly amusing is he uh, shows a thing about these um, uh, shells that are broken up and uh, there are a bunch of little pebbles around that could only be formed in a flood. Well, I looked up the deposit and I also looked up something else about the deposit. Uh, I'm sorry, but it's in a tidal bore. It's in a tidal estuary. Those things naturally form broken shells and pebbles. They can see them in tidal estuaries. It's a natural phenomenon, Snelling. How did you manage to miss that ye of the geology degree? Uh, and uh, in fact, there's a whole beaches areas all along New Zealand in the, where there's fossils and that comes from, where they've got these uh, estuary things. And then another one that I really loved, he made the mistake of calling attention to this one fossil uh, that's in real fine deposits, these fishes and other areas. Uh, it's a volcanic area. Those are pyroclastic flows. And there's actual airborne volcanic ash found in some of the other areas in that same deposit area. How do you get airborne volcanic ash underwater? Oh, you never discuss that. You always leave that out of your discussion. That's right. Now I remember. Oh, no, this was absolutely delightful. And Preacher, by the way, never responded to any of these things. Here he goes out of his way to call attention to a video that he insists is so solid. And I kept on asking him as well, did you fact check any of this? Did you fact check any of this? Did you fact check any of this? Now, if I can do it, real time, live, I can find the original primary source technical papers on this stuff. I had a gold mine. I think I have probably about 20 or 30 papers that I managed to glean off of this. And I spent the next day or two plugging them into my bibliography. Full text, PDFs. Uh, what the hell was preventing Preacher from doing that? What was preventing him from doing it? He's a bloody Tortugan. He doesn't think about things he doesn't think about. He doesn't do follow-up. He doesn't fact check a damn thing. He never has any standards for accepting the need to change his mind. Duh! But, uh, uh, of course, was I changing the preacher's mind? Of course not. But I hope the people following me, one of us was doing the homework and which one wasn't. <laughs> well, uh, he's another Tortukan. Uh, <laughs> Uh, Kent is is um, a secondary redactor. In that respect, Kent, Hoven, and Preacher are methodologically indistinguishable. Snelling, by contrast, is not. He's a fact claimant. And remember, that's a small group. There's only two dozen of them in the creation science field at currently operating, and one dozen intelligent designers, three dozen people altogether. Uh, they're the ones who actually make the fact claims. They should be in air quotes, but still fact claims. And so they're the ones that you can uh, um, uh, connect up with in terms of primary source data stream. That's a very different factor when you get over to Kent Hovind that I don't think has read a science paper in his life and co and constantly riffs off of creationism, often very old creationism. Uh, the uh, uh, Steve McRae's um, uh, moderating of the debate with uh, uh, King Crocodile was a perfectly fine example of the kind of generic stuff uh, uh, Kent does, and I, the one thing I really wanted Crocodile to ask Kent was to push back on source data. All to ask Kent, what, if any, technical papers on cosmology have you ever read? And how did you go about fact-checking them? Deer in the headlights silenced in a hurry from that. And if you had probed on his source base, 
bring out the regular science material on cosmology, but discuss what source base Kent has. That's where they fall apart. That's why, you know, if people have been following me on Twitter, I hope you notice how few people can answer that. What sources do you rely on and how do you fact check them question? You get the equivalent of deer in the headlight silence instantly because they, they can't answer it. They won't lie. He will not bear false witness. He will not claim to have read a paper he didn't, and he won't claim to have source checked it. Instead, he just shuts up. But how can you tell unless you ask him? And so uh, from a source methods point of view, we need some more hashtag tip in the world, don't you think? Hey? <laughs> Indeed. All right. Maybe I should put the link up. up uh, RJ, I put the link up. I put the link up for for uh, for your channel for the after show. I'll put it up a few more times before we wrap it up. So you, oh yeah, you know. Paul, I do in fact have a list of the fact claimants in tip, uh, and I'll uh, I'll uh, put a, a blurb on that um, in the uh, uh, comment section and stuff when we go over to the live um, uh, after show thing. I'll I'll pop that up and give you all the names on it. <laughs> Everybody had a good time. How many viewers did we have, by the way? Curiosity consumes me. We were, we were somewhat low this week. We were uh, at the peak. We were around, what, 18, I think. That's uh, Yeah, see, there's my, there's my curse of downer, you know. Uh, no, I'll, no. I'll, I'll, I'll destroy everything I touch. No, it's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's not that. It has nothing to do with that. What it was is um, the, the time we spent setting up the, uh, you know, OBS and everything to, to do all the, the streaming no so you could do the after show, I that took you know. up the time that I would usually be blasting on Twitter and <laughs> Facebook and everywhere else. Hey, RJ's on. Woo, come see. So well, I'll that, say to Paul, can't admit an appearance of age. Uh, that's an old argument. And the, the, the current crop of creationists try to avoid in a lot of that astronomy stuff. So for him to fall back on appearance of age, creation with apparent age, is old 1960s style creationism. He, he is atavistically uh, reverting he grew up on in his formative days as a creationist back in the 60s and 70s. And uh, uh, that doesn't surprise me in the least, because if you look at your Jason Lyles and that bunch, who actually have some technical experience in this area, they're the, a Faulkner in that over in the uh, AIG and ICR, um, they recognize that argument really doesn't cut it. And they're trying to find some weird ways to tweak the speed of light and cosmological stretch. You know, uh, uh, Kent uh, was copying that with stretching out the heavens bit, but that's uh, relatively side details. And the problem that Lyle and Faulkner and the other bunch have is they've got to fiddle with that damned E equal MC square problem. If you start tweaking with those fundamental constants, they have side effects elsewhere. And you just can't build a consistent physics that way any more than flat earthers can make an eclipse predictor with a flat earth. <laughs> well, I guess that's about it. Are we about ready to pull the plug and then move over to um, uh, my after show to see if I can get that little thing revved up? Oh, yes, yes. I, I believe that's uh, here we are at the top of the hour. Yeah, we started about a minute late, so we're ending about a minute late. Um, that is fine. Uh, you know what? Why don't I put up the uh, the link once again, just so it doesn't scroll off anybody's screen. And uh, if anybody needs it, we switch. Like you weren't able to copy it over or, or whatever. Uh, just you, you can hit, contact me on Twitter. I'll send you the link or, or G Plus or any old thing. Um, all right. That being the case. Um, I, I guess we could wrap it up and uh, get things started over on your channel and uh, give us a, a I put my wordpress.com thing. Other than the Patreon, every one of the links need for finances are there. Uh, all the free material and the, the GoFundMe link is there and links to both of my books in all different formats. Uh, so the only excuse anybody has for not the RJ uh, on getting my wonderful books is that they don't know how to mouse click or uh, they can't afford it. <laughs> and uh, and equally as important as uh, hitting those links is spread the word. RJ's got a lot of knowledge and he's never uh, hesitated to give it out for free. So uh, please tell everybody you know, RJ's the guy. We do a show here on uh, obviously on Wednesdays and uh, we're going to be migrating that over to where it's going to all be on RJ's channel. So uh, 
that being the case, thank you for joining us all, and uh, we'll see you over on RJ's channel, which oh, yeah. coincidentally... Are you going to be picking the link to um, the channel, uh, um, uh, or do you want me to as well? I put it up twice already. I'll put it up again just because I love doing Control V. Okay, I'll, I'll make sure that mine's got the thing. Uh, we'll see how that makes me feel all godlike. What the hell we're talking about? All right. Well, um, hopefully we'll see you all over there. And uh, yeah, Ooh, get... shit ton with an N E. Yes, is a, a metric ton or English ton or whatever. <laughs> all right. Let us uh, let us wrap it up here. Where's your where's your closing thing? Okay, I'm on the live stream screen now, and then right. once we're over there, I'll also I'll shut down the old live chat and I'll start up the secondary one over the other direction. Yeah, actually, no, oh, no, okay. So the uh, for, yeah for the and uh, for the hangouts, we'll we'll just let let this hangout session go. We don't need to shut this down and bring it back up. And uh, okay. And uh, yeah, I'm bringing out my live chat over on the live stream, and I'm on the live stream screen now. Excellent. Okay, here we go. Here's the uh, familiar uh, RJ closing. down RJ Evolution Hour. Bye, everybody. <laughs> we'll see you in a few minutes. Oh, yeah. Um, and there's a shout out to David313 who just rocks. Okay. Rocks.